What's up, everyone? Back for another episode of Victory Lap. Tonight we got a pretty big guest, former Purdue Boilermaker, former Seattle Dragons XFL player, Kirk Barron. Kirk, how we doing tonight? Good, man. How are you guys doing? Can't complain, can't complain. Surviving quarantine. And then, as yeah. always, got Nagy and Alina with us. How are we doing tonight, boys? Still uh, good, man. The day flew by. It was a busy one, but pumped for this interview. Yes, sir. So let's get to it. So Kirk, as I mentioned, he's played at Purdue and then he went on. He was in the NFL for a little bit, got drafted in the XFL, played the XFL for the year. So we're going to start with his college career. So Kirk, uh, so you, we talked a little bit before you got on. You're, you redshirted your freshman year, your redshirt mm-hmm. freshman year, or then you kind of rotated around a few games here and there. And then after that, you had 39 consecutive starts. So what was it like when you got that call or the coach told you, you know, you're getting your first college start? I mean, that had been a great feeling. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, so uh, going into the Iowa game, we really only had like seven linemen. Um, and one of the guys is really hurt. And then the left guard got hurt. Um, but it was kind of surreal because we were warming up at Iowa. Um, I think it was their senior night. Senior night. Um, this is when they were ranked fourth in the country. They were undefeated. And, like, 10 minutes to kick off, the line coach comes up to me and is like, yo, like, you're going to get a lot of clock this game, so just be prepared. And it's a pretty I mean, uh, big environment <laughs> to play your first game in, for sure. Yeah, this was at Iowa? Was, yeah, yeah. Iowa. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was pretty dope. Um, I mean, they're pretty hostile environment, um, and it was snowing. It was like a blizzard out. So. Um, you that a, was kind of surreal. You a cold weather guy? Does it matter Absolutely. to you? Absolutely not. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> hate it. I feel bro. that for sure. So, uh, so you started when you started playing. You were you got recruited by Coach Hazel, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Uh, you finished out your last two years with Coach Brom, who's a very energy guy. Uh, what was your first thought when Coach Brom had the first team meeting? Were you I mean, did he make you want to run through a brick wall? Because I feel like that guy is just like <laughs> a nut in a good way. Like, just makes you really pumped up to play football. Yeah, he's he's one of those guys where, um, you know, he's going to tell you how it is. And yeah. um, he's not going to, you know, candy coat anything. I, I remember, like, my first meeting with him, um, he kind of came up to me and was like, hey, like, I want to sit down and talk to you about whatever. And he was kind of breaking down the defense's game film from the year prior he was there. And I mean, I have nothing to do with the defense, but he kind of said, man, this is the NFL. I would fire every single one of our defensive players. And I, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where like, you don't know what to say. Right. And you're yeah, just like, back to that. you're like, yeah, I would too. And you, <laughs> you just kind of walk out of the room and you're like, yeah, whatever. And, um, but you know, he's really a no BS kind of guy. Um, yeah. And, uh, it, it kind of shows he's pretty smart when it comes to recruiting, being able to get some of these big time guys out of the Indy area or Louisville area. And yeah. uh yeah, he's a special dude. Yeah, so uh did you when he got hired, did you see that XFL video of him before or after he got hired? Yeah, so it was kinda when um it, his name was brought up like being interviewed because it kind of came down between him and Skip Holtz, I think. Okay. For the for the Purdue job and uh, yeah. kind of one of those things where when his name got brought up, people started tweeting the video out or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you kind of got a sense of what kind of guy he was. See, I never knew that was him until like, I don't remember <laughs> what game it was, but you guys won some game and they were like, this is the same guy. Because he was like pumped up on the sidelines yelling or something, or he might have yelled at, I feel like him and the defense coordinator yelled at each other or something. And it was like, yeah. It was like, you guys shouldn't be surprised. It's the same guy. And then they posted the XFL video. And I was like, oh, shit, I remember that video. Like, it was such a, such a hilarious. The video? I know I've seen it. It was the video where he's like, uh, he just had a concussion. and Yeah, okay, that's, that's what I thought. Like, this yeah. is the XFL. He's like, I have a pulse. I'm playing. And he was yeah. just like, yeah. it was awesome. But I never knew that was him. And I was like, damn, that guy is probably a lot of fun to play for, if that's yeah. the kind of yeah. guy he's like. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. When you, when you brought up how uh, – how big he, how big recruiting played a part, and obviously you guys coming off of the uh, one of the worst stretches in 
recent history at Purdue to then making two straight bowl games. I, how did how did he change the culture around there to get start getting some of those indie guys who are typically going to the uh, you know the the top notch Big Ten schools or the Notre Dame's at times and things like that. What what yeah. made the program more attractive? Um, I really, I, I think it kind of started from the top. So during that transition period, we also Morgan Burke, our AD, retired and. He was one of like the longest tenured ADs in the country. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say he was outdated. I like the guy, but we hired uh, Mike Babinski and he really kind of turned it up and um, they kind of hit the local major cities, I guess you could say, um, kind of talking to alumni. So like they would have a speaking event in Indianapolis. They would have a speaking event in Louisville, Chicago, um, I don't think they ever came to South Bend, but, uh, you know, they kind of got out and they started telling people like, Hey, like we're for real. Um, and, and we have like this huge pressure on us, our, our, my junior year. And, um, lucky for us, uh, we had the right uh, nucleus of guys in the room who could kind of, uh, make things happen. Yeah. So off of Olina's point, I think that's a good point. It's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, was it tough at times going through that rough stretch? Because, oh, I mean, I know you, <laughs> yeah. and you're, you're a guy who loves to win, hate, probably hates losing more than they like to win. So, yeah. Yeah, dude, that was one of the things where, um, you know, it, it was almost like we got up to play Illinois every year because we knew we'd beat them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like that'd be like, like oh, it's going to be a competitive Illinois game. Or, <laughs> and, like, that's it. Like, that's not a good mindset. Right. Um, when when you have like Big Ten caliber players on your team or whatever, and and it's just it, it kind of got really old, and guys just didn't want to either they either transferred or they left or what have you. So it you know the right guys stuck around. Yeah, I think that's a huge thing in college sports, especially football, is like weeding out the guys who you know they're just kind of in it for themselves, and then <clears throat> Coach Brom comes in, so you have a guy who's able to place a lot of things in the right places and you know the guys who stayed there really benefited them because I mean you guys you guys had such a big turnaround and uh I think a lot of success of Purdue in the future has to definitely go fall back on your class and the class behind you because you guys kind of kick-started everything so yeah that was that was a big thing so when coach Brom actually first stepped on campus he kind of we had that spring ball and that spring ball was actually hell so I mean, we were used to running like maybe 15 live plays of practice and he ramped up to like, we're running 60 live plays of practice. So you're getting a lot of like kind of end game reps. Mm -hmm. Um, And then post like spring practice, uh, he got about probably 30 guys who he didn't seem were fit to be on the roster. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made them sign a contract that said, if they don't uh, like benefit the team in any way, they're going to transfer. Wow. That's yeah. something you don't really hear, but that's actually, I mean, something you have to see it worked out for him, you know, yeah. like that's, that's pretty well, crazy. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. He was able to do that. And then it, it really was a best of both worlds because the guys that weren't going to benefit the team, they weren't going to play. Right. Yeah. So, sure. and because he was a new head coach, the NCAA like passed some rule like if you get a new coach and you want to transfer, you can do that. No yeah, holds yeah, bar. Yeah. Like you're not gonna sit out a year. So it was really kind of like Coach Brown recruiting on the team all over again, just right. with the guys on roster. Right. So yeah. that's pretty. Intense. How many people ended up leaving? You said thirty guys. Yeah, roughly thirty guys. Like the whole 2015 recruiting class. That's pretty crazy. Wow. That's pretty nuts. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a widely known fact. Yeah, I was yeah. about to say, that's probably not something a lot of people know. But yeah. I think that's, that's uh, that really sets the foundation for the culture you want to build. So props to him yeah. for doing that. Because I don't think a lot of coaches would have the balls to do that. No, they wouldn't. And, I mean, he got a lot of transfers from uh, WKU that year. I know we had, like, we had one from WKU, one from Rhode Island, uh, one from Wake Forest and another guy from NIU, and they all started that first year. So okay. it, it oh, kind of panned out. So uh, we all remember the Ohio State game. What was that? Because, yeah. like? I mean, that's like – so, you know, like you – like we said, you went from when you guys weren't very good to a sold-out Ross-Aid Stadium 
on national television on prime time playing what were they number one or two at the time yeah Yeah, they were two at the time and you guys just beat their ass like that had to have been one of the coolest moments ever yeah that was pretty nuts um yeah like you said it was under the lights prime time in west lafayette um and it was one of those things where throughout the week you know you kind of get a sense of who they were and Mm -hmm. uh I know as an offensive line, like that first day we pulled up on, I think it was Monday or Tuesday to break down the film, like of their previous games. We watched a TCU game and we were just like, oh my God, these guys are inhuman the way they get off the ball as a defense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it shows, I think every single person on that D line has gotten drafted in the past two years. I so think it, everyone it, on that defense <laughs> has been drafted, not just the D yeah. line, which is like absurd. Yeah. So that's one of those things where you kind of watch them on film and you're like, wow, we have a lot to handle this week. And then um, they had a lot of tendencies where uh, they played cover two um, and they'd like press the corners. And we had a pretty good quarterback, David. Um, So, I mean, he was able to kind of pick them apart. And obviously we have Rondell. um, So he was pretty special and he made a lot of plays happen. And we put in a couple of new plays that week. um, And I think they all hit for like, 60 yard touchdowns uh, in the run game <laughs> that's definitely how you draw wow. it up that's pretty crazy <laughs> there there were so many times where just like the classic um underdog like has a lead going into the fourth and you're like okay here comes ohio state <clears throat> to like bring it back to a uh you know a tie game or them take the lead or whatever and every single time you guys had that big play to then spark the momentum right back on your side and like the crowd stayed in the entire game i, I, I remember watching it, i was like I just had a feeling that um, something crazy was about to happen. It kept happening in your guys' favor. It was, it was just like a nuts nuts game to watch, no doubt. Yeah, I think we definitely set the tempo um, with our first touchdown. David threw like a, a crazy over-the-shoulder deep ball to Zico um, in the end zone. And, I mean, he made an unbelievable catch and like a toe-tap catch. And Oh, yeah. Uh, it just kind of that. That's when we were like, "All right, these guys are not that good. We can expose." Yeah, you know. Was that your like, first, first drive, or no? Uh, I think it was. It's either yeah. first or second, but I know yeah. like we were the first to score for sure. Yeah, yeah. That, that just sets the tone. Like you guys can fucking do it. Like I, I remember, I remember games like that when you're thinking like you're playing a really good team and you finally get that that first touchdown. You're like, "All right, we can do this." You guys, yeah. I just remember that fourth quarter was just insane. You guys put up, I think, was it 28 points you put up in the fourth quarter? Yeah, so the play we were, like, the thing is that we knew um, some of their linebackers were not, able, like, they were not going to be able to touch any of our skill guys. Yeah. Um, so the last, the, the big play that happened with Rondale is when, you know, it was like a little screen pass and he took it to the crib. But yeah, um, that play was nasty. Yeah, the crazy thing about it is that we knew that they were playing man because everyone's pressed. They had one deep safety, so pretty much cover one. Mm-hmm. Um, and as soon as David sends Rondell in motion, that linebacker who we knew that we were going to be able to pick on the entire night, he goes out to try and guard Rondell. Then, you know, it was kind of like game yeah, over. Is, so you, yeah, yeah, you just know it's over. That's, that's the best. Was that yeah. the loudest you've ever heard Ross Aid? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it was definitely up there between that and the Iowa game we had at home where we won like a last-second field goal. Okay, yeah. yeah. Last question about college I have. Nagy's an IU fan. How much do you hate IU? Because I hate IU, too, and I don't even play football. Can't, too, but... can't stand them. Can't stand them. <laughs> is, that, is, that your top, is that your most hated team? Um, most hated team. Yeah, probably. Um, okay. You know, I, will, kinda... I will say, like, from an IU, an IU guy, like, I was a senior when that Ohio State game took place. And, like, me and all my roommates, like, all from South Bend, were huddled around TV during that game. And we were all rooting for Purdue. And we're, like, third quarter in, we're, like, yo, what the fuck? We've been rooting for Purdue. <laughs> and we're, like, we're, we're rooting for Purdue, right? And we're all, like, yeah, we're rooting for Purdue. Yeah, man, it's one of those things. Like, I, I don't like IU, but you definitely respect them. Um, I mean, my senior year when we played them, I think we were five and six going in there, and we had to beat them to get to a bowl game. Right, like, we were the best when it was. I think uh, I think it was our my junior year. So uh, 
three three football seasons ago, both were five and six. Yeah, and fighting for the bowl game. I think yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You guys yeah. finished at Rossade. And then we had a I, – I think you guys were – uh, spoiling our bowl, our bowl game in the 2019 se- or the 2018 season, 2018-2019. Yeah, because that – yeah, that was my junior year, my retro junior year. And I think, yeah, we were both five and six at the time. And it was one of those things like – like they, like that game came down to an onside kick recovery. Yeah. Right. And, and it was one of those feelings like when the game's going on, you're like, dude, we are manhandling these guys. Like, I don't know – why the score is 28 to 24 right now. Right, but they have a chance to win at the end of the game. Like, that's – yeah. those are the craziest games. Only do you have any more questions about his time at Purdue? Um, I, I was, my, my question was, I guess, to follow up, but who, who's your, like, second most hated team? Or I guess that people wouldn't think that you guys just hated them. Like, not, a, not one that would come off the top of the head if you had to take some, some random guesses. Min- Minnesota, like, by far. Ooh. Minnesota? Really? Dude, we – like, it wasn't even, like, the players. We just hated P.J. Fleck. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I'm with you on that one. I can't like, stand that dude. Like, bro, it was one of those things. Like, I remember, like, we were watching the film, and he did this thing where, like, at the end of the quarter, he would sprint to the other side. Oh, of the yeah. yeah. Dude, I, I remember seeing that one time, and I was like, dude, what is this guy fucking doing? And yeah. then, like, every time, like, they had their defense, like, got us out of a third down they'd like raise their hands up and it would be on film like leading up to the game like us like preparing for him and you could just see him like putting their hands up or whatever and I mean every time we got a first down I think the whole line put our hands up like you know. <laughs> so cool. you know it, it, that's just a school that you know you respect their players but just the guy who's leading them is just a huge dick for sure yeah I feel that for sure I, I can re- definitely respect that that choice of second hated team um oh, yeah. okay so you then went undrafted you jumped around to two nfl teams you're with the dolphins and the Bengals for a little bit right yeah and uh you played very well from the Bengals, from what i read and uh yeah. is it so is it tough when you like you know you're playing very well but it's like it's the nfl is probably the hardest sport to make it in easily i in my opinion i think it's the hardest sport to make it in so it's yeah. like does sometimes it discourage you or does some, I mean, does it make you want to work harder, a little bit of both or what? It's definitely a little bit of both. I mean, I remember when I got cut from Miami, it wasn't even because of the way I was playing. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I was playing really well. Um, I was actually at a huge disadvantage. So mm-hmm. I didn't even get like signed out of college. I didn't go to a rookie mini camp invite. Okay. Um, ended up getting signed out of that um, like little mini camp deal. Right. Meanwhile, the rest of, like, the the drafted guys, the UDFAs, they had a playbook and everything. Right. So, I, I was behind the eight ball and pretty much the whole deal. So, that was kind of tough. Um, but, I mean, I still played really well. I learned the offense, like, a decent amount. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason I got cut, I mean, Coach Flores pretty much looked at me and said, you know, the only reason you're getting cut is because you're the 90th guy to sign. Right. That, that was in Miami? You didn't even have a playbook? And everybody else did? Yeah, like, pulling up, like, there was, like, a personnel, like, because they were big on, like, knowing your teammates. So they would flash mm-hmm. pictures of guys, like, I could, like, just their faces. And they'd be like, and they'd call you out, like, in the team meeting room, like, hey, who is this to a rookie? And you, like, have to respond. And I'm like, I have no clue. Right, yeah. That's got to be oh, so, difficult. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, shit. No, go ahead. Um, was – was your uh, – would you say – so, obviously, you had to learn a play co- playbook on the jump, but – Wait, hold on, boys, boys. So, I got this notification that says, meeting will end in 10 minutes upgrade to remove time limit. Like, it's making me upgrade this time. I, ne- I never got that message before. Okay. Are you going to upgrade or – I mean, I don't know how. Now let's see what it is. All right, I'm going to ask this question then. So – would you say the playbooks in college, like Coach Brom's playbook, was similar at all? Was the NFL a lot harder? Or did you think going into it, it was going to be a lot harder than what it was? Or, um, Like the difference in college and uh, the NFL is like, especially for an offensive lineman, in college, like we ran very up-tempo uh, one-word right. plays, right? And then like 
we would have two different plays, but one would be like with a tight end and one would be without a tight end. So you wouldn't have to like take the, the mic point into accountability because of it. Mm-hmm. But in college, they kind of expect you to know the formation. I mean, in the NFL, they expect you to know the formations, uh, personnel, down and distance. So it's more of a cerebral game at that point in time. Okay. I feel that. So then from that, you did so you you have to enter your name in the XFL draft, right? You had to enter your name. So yes, or, yeah. So like my first agent, uh, he put it in for me. Um, okay. He put it in for me like a week after I got signed by the Dolphins, and then I, I was kind of pissed about that. I'm like, dude, I'm making the team. Like, don't worry about it. Right, right. And he entered my name, and thank God he did. But right. So then you went fiftieth um, in the XFL draft. Yeah. And then you went to the Seattle Dragons. Um, do you do you think going to an NFL camp definitely helped prepare you for the XFL camp? Because I feel like that definitely gets you in. Because I would assume it's a little different than college, but it gets you in like that mindset, kind of like you know, you're ready to go. Yeah, the thing about the XFL is that a lot of the guys have like a ton of like of accredited seasons in the NFL. Okay. So um, my roommate Dylan Day, he played uh, Mississippi State. He was Dak Prescott center. Okay. Um, went to the Reese's Senior Bowl, played for the Broncos, won a Super Bowl with them, and then kind of like bounced around after that. But I mean, I think he had like three accredited seasons. Okay. Um, so a lot of the guys played in the NFL. Um, so yeah, if I didn't have that kind of experience, I think I would have been behind the eight ball. Yeah, for sure. I think it definitely helps you out. Um, so then the XFL season started. Uh, you did not start the first game, right? And then someone yeah. got injured, and then you you went into the starting lineup? Yeah, so um, how it originally started, the deal was, like, I think they kind of expected me to, like, come into training camp and not be that good. Um, okay. So I ended up, like, outperforming, I guess, whatever they thought I was going to perform like. And, uh, um the deal was that I was going to play the second half and my other guy was going to play the first half. Okay. Um, then the left guard gets hurt, like, within the first four plays of the game. They still don't play me. They play some other guy. Uh, the next week pulls around. The center's hurt. So I start that game, and then it kind of took it from there. Um, and I just kind of had a really good game against Dallas, I think. It was our third game. Yeah, they definitely underestimated you because uh, you didn't start and then – a lot of the reporters had you on the all midseason honor team honors for XFL. So yeah. I think you definitely definitely did what you're supposed to do and they definitely should have been starting you from the start. But um <laughs> did you so did you see a transition from cuz college I feel like it's definitely a huge bond. Yes, you are competing a lot, but it's all the guys in the same thing. Now when you turn yeah. transition to a league that it is your job, do you see how it kind of affects not relationships in a sense, but like, it's definitely like every man's on their own. Oh, for sure. Like, um, that's what I thought was when I was in Miami, I thought it was so different. Um, being like Ryan Fitzpatrick might be like one of the coolest guys I've ever been with. Like, Oh, he really? wanted to watch, yeah. Like he was like, yo, you want to watch film or whatever? And I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Um, but a lot of times, a lot of those guys don't even like get to know, like are like let's just say like the undrafted rookies names because they know they're not going to be here within two weeks you know what i'm saying right. right so like yeah i guess if you're like a seasoned vet like if you're russell wilson you're going to get to know cam chancellor or something like that but yeah for sure outside of like the the guy on a football team like no one really knows the the people okay that's i think that's an interesting thing that like I think that's like such a transition because like I feel like you had a pretty pretty strong brotherhood at Purdue with a bunch of your teammates and uh yeah. it's definitely a different vibe because you go into this thing and like one you're now like you were on top you know you're the guy you're the leader you were a captain at Purdue so then you move to this and it's like damn I'm on the bottom of the totem pole half these yeah. guys want to get to know me so I mean that's it kind of it kind of makes you like remember like damn like now it's it's a business like it is a sport and it is what I love to do but I got to remember it is a business too. Yeah, it definitely changes like your attitude. Like 
I mean, you could be buddy buddy with some guy who plays, uh, let's say he plays linebacker or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, if you guys are both fringe guys, like you guys are still competing for the same roster spot. Right. Right. Like you're you're not in comp- spots. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing though is that you're not competing for like a start. Like yeah, you're obviously competing for a starting role, but. If you know you're a fringe guy, like most people are in the NFL, or like a special team guy, mm-hmm. like you need to realize, like, dude, I'm not competing to play offensive line. I'm competing to also get this roster spot that's like anywhere from 35 on down. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's <clears throat> it's that's why you know everyone always says it's a business and it's tough to get grasp your mind around it, but yeah. it's what it is. So each week. We have Nagy ask a question. It's the nagging question of the week. Nagy, what's your question this week? Yeah, so, Kirk, I watched some of your Purdue highlights uh, uh, earlier today, and you got really good, like, really great speed, like getting the line linebackers on outside run plays. So I think you're pretty fast and also, like, pretty strong for your size, like being a center. Um, mm-hmm. So my question was going to be if – who do you think the toughest guy in the NFL is that you could take on in a five round boxing match? <laughs> uh, the toughest guy. Um, damn, that's a good question. I think uh, I think I could take. Uh, oh God, I think I would take uh, Kiko Alonso. Ooh. That's a solid one. That's solid. Yeah. Dude, dude's a freak, but I think I could take him. All right. So we got two minutes left. We're going to rapid fire a few fan questions. Um, one, learning – this is from my dad. He wanted to know if the learning curve is harder to jump from high school to college or college to pro. High school to college because I don't think I've made a single line call in high school. High school to college, you say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like, I think we just know he did. <laughs> like, I think, I think we just came up to the line of scrimmage and we're like, yeah, let's Pointed at who you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then Kale Gabler asked, toughest D lineman you ever went up against? Uh, probably going to go with um, – this is actually a sleeper. Lorenzo Neal. He played, He did play for Purdue. But yeah, yeah, okay. Dude's, dude's a stud. He's going to be probably like a top 30 pick next year. Okay, damn, I feel that. Tony Violi asked, can you compare the competition in the Big Ten versus the level competition in the XFL? Yes, I think it's way better. In the Big Ten? Yeah, XFL is way more competitive than the Big Ten. Okay. I see, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't – wouldn't. Uh, no, yeah, they wouldn't get that because, like, that, there is a huge cutoff. But like, there's some guys who play in the Big Ten, and you're like, what the hell are you doing? For sure. But, and I think that's what a lot of people don't realize about, like, playing in the XFL. Like, it's still a professional thing. So, like, it's still everyone was the best – one of the best players on their college team. And that's every college team are competing for those roster spots. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we appreciate it, Kurt. Thank you for coming on. Um, absolutely. Anytime. We'll have to bring you back on. Uh, yeah, for real. We'll sh- we'll upload the video. Shout you out. Appreciate everything. Uh, we'll see you. All right. Sounds good, boys.